Section 20 of Library of World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Darvinia. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 4 by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 20. Zadig the Babylonian by Voltaire. Part 3. The Basilisk. Arriving in a beautiful meadow, he there saw several women, who were searching for something with great application. He took the liberty to approach one of them, and to ask if he might have the honour to assist them in their search. "'Take care that thou dost not,' replied the Syrian. "'What we are searching for can be touched only by women.' "'Strange,' said Zadig, "'may I presume to ask thee what it is that women only are permitted to touch?' "'It is a basilisk,' said she. "'A basilisk, madam! And for what purpose, pray, dost thou seek for a basilisk?' It is for our lord and master Ogul, whose cattle thou seest on the bank of that river at the end of the meadow. We are his most humble slaves. The lord Ogul is sick. His physician hath ordered him to eat a basilisk stewed in rose-water. And as it is a very rare animal, and can only be taken by women, the lord Ogul hath promised to choose for his well-beloved wife the woman that shall bring him a basilisk. Let me go on in my search, for thou seest what I shall lose if I am prevented by my companions. Zadig left her and the other Assyrians to search for their basilisk, and continued to walk in the meadow. When coming to the brink of a small rivulet, he found another lady lying on the grass, and who was not searching for anything. Her person seemed to be majestic, but her face was covered with a veil. She was inclined toward the rivulet, and profound sighs proceeded from her mouth. In her hand she held a small rod with which she was tracing characters on the fine sand that lay between the turf and the brook. Zadig had the curiosity to examine what this woman was writing. He drew near. He saw the letter Z, then an A. He was astonished. Then appeared a D. He started, but never was surprise equal to his when he saw the two last letters of his name. He stood for some time immovable, at last breaking silence with a faltering voice. O oh, generous lady, pardon a stranger, an unfortunate man, for presuming to ask thee by what surprising adventure I here find the name of Zadig, traced out by thy divine hand. At this voice, and these words, the lady lifted up the veil with a trembling hand, looked at Zadig, sent forth a cry of tenderness, surprise, and joy, and sinking under the various emotions which at once assaulted her soul, fell speechless into his arms. It was Astarte herself, it was the Queen of Babylon, it was she whom Zadig adored, and whom he had reproached himself for adoring. It was she whose misfortunes he had so deeply lamented, and for whose fate he had been so anxiously concerned. He was for a moment deprived of the use of his senses, when he had fixed his eyes on those of Astarte, which now began to open again, with a languor mixed with confusion and tenderness. O oh, ye mortal powers, cried he, who preside over the fates of weak mortals, do ye indeed restore a start to me? At what a time, in what a place, and in what a condition do I again behold her? He fell on his knees before a start, and laid his face in the dust at her feet. The queen of Babylon raised him up, and made him sit by her side on the brink of the rivulet. She frequently wiped her eyes, from which the tears continued to flow afresh. She twenty times resumed her discourse, which her sighs as often interrupted. 
she asked by what strange accident they were brought together, and suddenly prevented his answers by other questions. She waived the account of her own misfortunes, and desired to be informed of those of Zadig. At last, both of them having a little composed the tumult of their souls, Zadig acquainted her in a few words by what adventure he was brought into that meadow. But, O oh unhappy and respectable queen, by what means do I find thee in this lonely place, clothed in the habit of a slave, and accompanied by other female slaves, who are searching for a basilisk, which by order of the physician is to be stewed in rose-water? While they are searching for their basilisk, said the fair Astarte, I will inform thee of all I have suffered, for which heaven has sufficiently recompensed me by restoring thee to my sight. Thou knowest that the king, my husband, was vexed to see thee the most amiable of mankind, and that for this reason he one night resolved to strangle thee and poison me. Thou knowest how heaven permitted my little mute to inform me of the orders of his sublime majesty. Hardly had the faithful Cador advised thee to depart, in obedience to my command, when he ventured to enter my apartment at midnight by a secret passage. He carried me off, and conducted me to the temple of Oromazes, where the Magi his brother shut me up in that huge statue whose base reaches to the foundation of the temple, and whose top rises to the summit of the dome." I was there buried in a manner, but was saved by the Magi, and supplied with all the necessaries of life. At break of day His Majesty's apothecary entered my chamber, with a potion composed of a mixture of henbane, opium, hemlock, black hellebore, and aconite, and another officer went to thine with a bowstring of blue silk. Neither of us was to be found. Cador, the better to deceive the king, pretended to come and accuse us both. He said that thou hast taken the road to Indies, and I that to Memphis, on which the king's guards were immediately dispatched in pursuit of us both. The couriers who pursued me did not know me. I had hardly ever shown my face to any but thee, and to thee only in the presence and by the order of my husband. They conducted themselves in the pursuit by the description that had been given them of my person. On the frontiers of Egypt they met with a woman of the same stature with me, and possessed perhaps of greater charms. She was weeping and wandering. They made no doubt but that this woman was the queen of Babylon, and accordingly brought her to Moabdar. Their mistake at first threw the king into a violent passion. But having viewed this woman more attentively, he found her extremely handsome, and was comforted. She was called Misuf. I have since been informed that this name in the Egyptian language signifies the capricious fair one. She was so in reality, but she had as much cunning as caprice. She pleased Moabdar, and gained such an ascendancy over him, as to make him choose her for his wife. Her character then began to appear in its true colours. She gave herself up, without scruple, to all the freaks of a wanton imagination. She would have obliged the chief of the Magi, who was old and gouty, to dance before her, and on his refusal she persecuted him with the most unrelenting cruelty. She ordered her master of the horse to make her a pie of sweetmeats. In vain did he represent that he was not a pastry-cook. He was obliged to make it, and lost his place, because it was baked a little too hard. The post of master of the horse she gave to her dwarf, and that of chancellor to her page. In this manner did she govern Babylon. Everybody regretted the loss of me. The king, who till the moment of his resolving to poison me and strangle thee, had been a tolerably good kind of man seemed now to have drowned all his virtues in his immoderate fondness for this capricious fair one. He came to the temple on the great day of the feast held in honour of the sacred fire. I saw him implore the gods in behalf of Misuf, at the feet of the statue in which I was enclosed. I raised my voice. I cried out, "'The gods reject the prayers of a king who is now become a tyrant!' 
and who attempted to murder a reasonable wife, in order to marry a woman remarkable for nothing but her folly and extravagance. At these words Moabdar was confounded, and his head became disordered. The oracle I had pronounced, and the tyranny of Misuf, conspired to deprive him of his judgment, and in a few days his reason entirely forsook him. Moabdar's madness, which seemed to be the judgment of heaven, was the signal to a revolt. The people rose and ran to arms, and a Babylon, which had been so long immersed in idleness and effeminacy, became the theatre of a bloody civil war. I was taken from the heart of my statue, and placed at the head of a party. Cador flew to Memphis to bring thee back to Babylon. The prince of Hyrcania, informed of these fatal events, returned with his army, and made a third party in Chaldea. He attacked the king, who fled before him with his capricious Egyptian. Moabdar died pierced with wounds. I myself had the misfortune to be taken by a party of Hyrcanians, who conducted me to their prince's tent, at the very moment that Misuf was brought before him. Thou wilt doubtless be pleased to hear that the prince thought me beautiful, but thou wilt be sorry to be informed that he designed me for his seraglio. He told me with a blunt and resolute air, that as soon as he had finished a military expedition, which he was just going to undertake, he would come to me. Judge how great must have been my grief. My ties with Moabdar were already dissolved. I might have been the wife of Zadig, and I was fallen into the hands of a barbarian. I answered him with all the pride which my high rank and noble sentiment could inspire. I had always heard it affirmed that heaven stamped on persons of my condition a mark of grandeur, which, with a single word or glance, could reduce to the lawlessness of the most profound respect those rash and forward persons who presume to deviate from the rules of politeness. I spoke like a queen, but was treated like a maidservant. The Hyrcanian, without even deigning to speak to me, told his black eunuch that I was impertinent, but that he thought me handsome. He ordered him to take care of me, and to put me under the regime of favourites, that, so my complexion being improved, I might be the more worthy of his favours when he should be at leisure to honour me with them. I told him that rather than submit to his desires I would put an end to my life. He replied with a smile that women, he believed, were not so bloodthirsty and that he was accustomed to such violent expressions, and then left me with the air of a man who had just put another parrot into his aviary. What a state for the first queen of the universe, and what is more for a heart devoted to Zadig! At these words Zadig threw himself at her feet, and bathed them with his tears. Astarte raised him with great tenderness, and thus continued her story. I now saw myself in the power of a barbarian, and rival to the foolish woman with whom I was confined. She gave me an account of her adventures in Egypt. From the description she gave me of your person, from the time, from the dromedary on which you were mounted, and from every other circumstance, I inferred that Zadig was the man who had fought for her. I doubted not, but that you were at Memphis, and therefore resolved to repair thither. Beautiful Misof, said I, thou art more handsome than I, and will please the prince of Hyrcania much better. Assist me in contriving the means of my escape. Thou wilt then reign alone. Thou wilt at once make me happy, and rid thyself of a rival. Misof concerted with me the means of my flight and I departed secretly with a female Egyptian slave. As I approached the frontiers of Arabia, a famous robber named Arbogad seized me and sold me to some merchants, who brought me to this castle, where Lord Ogul resides. He bought me without knowing who I was. He is a voluptuary, ambitious of nothing but good living, and thinks that God sent him into the world for no other purpose than to sit at table. 
he is so extremely corpulent that he is always in danger of suffocation. His physician, who has but little credit with him when he has a good digestion, governs him with a despotic sway when he has ate too much. He has persuaded him that a basilisk stewed in rose-water will effect a complete cure. The Lord Ogul hath promised his hand to the female slave that brings him a basilisk. Thou seest that I leave them to vie with each other in meriting this honour, and never was I less desirous of finding the basilisk than since heaven hath restored thee to my sight. This account was succeeded by a long conversation between Astarte and Zadig, consisting of everything that their long-suppressed sentiments, their great sufferings, and their mutual love could inspire into hearts the most noble and tender. And the genii who preside over love carried their words to the sphere of Venus. The women returned to Ogul without having found the basilisk. Zadig was introduced to this mighty lord, and spoke to him in the following terms. May immortal health descend from heaven to bless all thy days. I am a physician. At the first report of thy indisposition I flew to thy castle, and have now brought thee a basilisk stewed in rose-water. Not that I pretend to marry thee. All I ask is the liberty of a Babylonian slave, who hath been in thy possession for a few days. And if I should not be so happy as to cure thee, magnificent Lord Ogul, I consent to remain a slave in her place. The proposal was accepted. Astarte set out for Babylon with Zadig's servant, promising immediately upon her arrival to send a courier to inform him of all that had happened. Their parting was as tender as their meeting. The moment of meeting and that of parting are the two greatest epochs of life, as saith the great book of Zend. Zadig loved the queen with as much ardour as he professed, and the queen more than she thought proper to acknowledge. Meanwhile Zadig spoke thus to Ogul, My lord, my basilisk is not to be eaten. All its virtues must enter through thy pores. I have enclosed it in a little ball, blown up and covered with a fine skin. Thou must strike this ball with all thy might, and I must strike it back for a considerable time, and by observing this regime for a few days thou wilt see the effects of my art. The first day Ogul was out of breath, and thought he should have died with fatigue. The second he was less fatigued, slept better. In eight days he recovered all the strength, all the health, all the agility and cheerfulness of his most agreeable years. Thou hast played at ball, and thou hast been temperate, said Zadig. Know that there is no such thing in nature as a basilisk, that temperance and exercise are the two great preservatives of health, and that the art of reconciling intemperance and health is as chimerical as the philosopher's stone judicial astrology, or the theology of the Magi. Ogul's first physician, observing how dangerous this man might prove to the medical art, formed a design, in conjunction with the apothecary, to send Zadig to search for a basilisk in the other world. Thus, having suffered such a long train of calamities on account of his good actions, he was now upon the point of losing his life for curing a gluttonous lord. He was invited to an excellent dinner, and was to have been poisoned in the second course. But during the first he happily received a courier from the fair Astarte. When one is beloved by a beautiful woman, says the great Zoroaster, he hath always the good fortune to extricate himself out of every kind of difficulty and danger. THE COMBATS the queen was received at Babylon with all those transports of joy which are ever felt on the return of a beautiful princess who hath been involved in calamities. Babylon was now in greater tranquillity. The prince of Hyrcania had been killed in battle. The victorious Babylonians declared that the queen should marry the man whom they should choose for their sovereign. 
they were resolved that the first place in the world, that of being husband to Astarte and king of Babylon, should not depend on cabals and intrigues. They swore to acknowledge for king the man who, upon trial, should be found to be possessed of the greatest valour and the greatest wisdom. Accordingly, at the distance of a few leagues from the city, a spacious place was marked out for the list, surrounded with magnificent amphitheatres. Thither the combatants were to repair in complete armour. Each of them had a separate apartment behind the amphitheatres, where they were neither to be seen nor known by any one. Each was to encounter four knights, and those that were so happy as to conquer four were then to engage with one another so that he who remained the last master of the field would be proclaimed conqueror at the games. Four days after he was to return with the same arms, and to explain the enigmas proposed by the magi. If he did not explain the enigmas, he was not king. And the running at the lances was to be begun afresh, till a man would be found who was conqueror in both these combats for they were absolutely determined to have a king possessed of the greatest wisdom and the most invincible courage. The queen was all the while to be strictly guarded. She was only allowed to be present at the games, and even there she was to be covered with a veil, but was not permitted to speak to any of the competitors, that so they might neither receive favour nor suffer injustice. These particulars Astarte communicated to her lover, hoping that in order to obtain her he would show himself possessed of greater courage and wisdom than any other person. Zadig set out on his journey, beseeching Venus to fortify his courage and enlighten his understanding. He arrived on the banks of the Euphrates on the eve of this great day. He caused his device to be inscribed among those of the combatants, concealing his face and his name as the law ordained and then went to repose himself in the apartment that fell to him by lot. His friend Cador, who, after the fruitless search he had made for him in Egypt, was now returned to Babylon, sent to his tent a complete suit of armour, which was a present from the queen, as also from himself one of the finest horses in Persia. Zadig presently perceived that these presents were sent by Astarte, and from thence his courage derived fresh strength, and his love the most animating hopes. Next day, the queen being seated under a canopy of jewels, and the amphitheatres filled with all the gentlemen and ladies of rank in Babylon, the combatants appeared in the circus. Each of them came and laid his device at the feet of the grand magi. They drew their devices by lot, and that of Zadig was the last. The first who advanced was a certain lord named Etobad, very rich and very vain, but possessed of little courage, of less address, and hardly of any judgment at all. His servants had persuaded him that such a man as he ought to be king. He had said in reply, Such a man as I ought to reign. And thus they had armed him for a cap pie. He wore an armour of gold enamelled with green a plume of green feathers, and a lance adorned with green ribbons. It was instantly perceived by the manner in which Etobad managed his horse that it was not for such a man as he that heaven reserved the sceptre of Babylon. The first knight that ran against him threw him out of his saddle. The second laid him flat on his horse's buttocks, with his legs in the air, and his arms extended. Etobad recovered himself, but with so bad a grace that the whole amphitheatre burst out a-laughing. The third knight disdained to make use of his lance, but, making a pass at him, took him by the right leg, and wheeling him half round, laid him prostrate on the sand. The squires of the game ran to him laughing, and replaced him in his saddle. The fourth combatant took him by the left leg, and tumbled him down on the other side. He was conducted back with scornful shouts to his tent, where, according to the law, he was to pass the night, and as he limped along with great difficulty he said, What an adventure for such a man as I! 
the other knights acquitted themselves with greater ability and success. Some of them conquered two combatants, a few of them vanquished three. But none but Prince Otamus conquered four. At last Zadig fought him in his turn. He successfully threw four knights off their saddles, with all the grace imaginable. It then remained to be seen who should be conqueror, Otamus or Zadig. The arms of the first were gold and blue, with a plume of the same color. Those of the last were white. The wishes of all the spectators were divided between the knight in blue and the knight in white. The queen, whose heart was in a violent palpitation, offered prayers to heaven for the success of the white color. The two champions made their passes and vaults with so much agility, they mutually gave and received such dexterous blows with their lances, and sat so firmly in their saddles, that everybody but the queen wished there might be two kings in Babylon. At length, their horses being tired and their lances broken, Zadig had recourse to his stratagem. He passes behind the blue prince, springs upon the buttocks of his horse, seizes him by the middle, throws him on the earth, places himself in the saddle, and wheels around Otamus as he lay extended on the ground. All the amphitheatre cried out, Victory to the white knight! Otamus rises in a violent passion and draws his sword. Zadig leaps from his horse with his sabre in his hand. Both of them are now on the ground, engaged in a new combat, where strength and agility triumph by turns. The plumes of their helmets, the studs of their bracelets, the rings of their armor, are driven to a great distance by the violence of a thousand furious blows. They strike with the point and the edge, to the right, to the left, on the head, on the breast. They retreat, they advance, they measure swords, they close, they seize each other, they bend like serpents, they attack like lions, and the fire every moment flashes from their blows. At last Zadig, having recovered his spirits, stops, makes a feint, leaps upon Otamus, throws him on the ground and disarms him, and Otamus cries out, It is thou alone, O white knight, that oughtest to reign over Babylon. The queen was now at the height of her joy. The knight in blue armor and the knight in white were conducted each to his own apartment, as well as all the others, according to the intention of the law. Mutes came to wait upon them and to serve them at table. It may be easily supposed that the queen's little mute waited upon Zadig. They were then left to themselves to enjoy the sweets of repose till next morning, at which time the conqueror was to bring his device to the Grand Magi, to compare it with that which he had left, and make himself known. Zadig, though deeply in love, was so much fatigued that he could not help sleeping. Itobad, who lay near him, never closed his eyes. He arose in the night, entered his apartment, took the white arms and the device of Zadig, and put his green armor in their place. At break of day he went boldly to the Grand Magi to declare that so great a man as he was conqueror. This was little expected. However, he was proclaimed while Zadig was still asleep. Astarte, surprised and filled with despair, returned to Babylon. The amphitheatre was almost empty when Zadig awoke. He sought for his arms, but could find none but the green armour. With this he was obliged to cover himself, having nothing else near him. Astonished and enraged, he put it on in a furious passion, and advanced in this equipage. The people that still remained in the amphitheatre and the circus received him with hoots and hisses. They surrounded him and insulted him to his face. Never did man suffer such cruel mortifications. He lost his patience. With his sabre he dispersed such of the populace as dared to affront him. But he knew not what course to take. He could not see the queen. He could not claim the white armor she had sent him without exposing her. And thus, while she was plunged in grief, he was filled with fury and distraction. He walked on the banks of the Euphrates, fully persuaded that his star had destined him to inevitable misery, 
and resolving in his own mind all his misfortunes, from the adventure of the woman who hated one-eyed men to that of his armour. This, said he, is the consequence of my having slept too long. Had I slept less, I should now have been king of Babylon and in possession of Astarte. Knowledge, virtue, and courage have hitherto served only to make me miserable. He then let fall some secret murmurings against Providence, and was tempted to believe that the world was governed by a cruel destiny, which oppressed the good and prospered knights in green armour. One of his greatest mortifications was his being obliged to wear that green armour, which had exposed him to such contumelious treatment. A merchant happening to pass by, he sold it to him for a trifle, and bought a gown and a long bonnet. In this garb he proceeded along the banks of the Euphrates, filled with despair, and secretly accusing Providence, which thus continued to persecute him with unremitting severity. End of section 20